Well, we're finishing up a series called The Shortest Epistles today, uh, where we're winding up our study uh, through the last short epistle that we've looked at, and that's Philemon. And so I just want to start out this morning, let's just go ahead and read those last few lines in Philemon. We're going to start at verse 17, we're going to read through verse 25. In, uh, in Paul's letter to Philemon. He says, If then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would me, but if he's wronged you or owes anything, put that on my account. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay, not to mention to you, that you owe me even your own self besides. Yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. But meanwhile, also, prepare a guest room for me, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be granted to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Jesus in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. This is the word of God. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, Lord, we do bow before you this morning. And Lord, we're so grateful today that we have the opportunity just to open your word. Your word is truth. Lord, we're thankful for those that are passionate enough to, to uh, tune in and hear and listen. And so, God, we pray today that uh, for those that hear this message today, God, speak to our hearts. God, uh, uh, Convict us of sin and align our hearts and lives with you. God, do your work for your glory right now in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, when Ivy was just a little thing, it was uh, getting close to Christmas. We were living over at uh, Southeastern Seminary. and um, I don't remember exactly what year it was, but... but um, Christy had, had bought me a Carhartt jacket for Christmas. It's what I, I wanted, I needed, and I'd asked for. And evidently Ivy was with her, you know, when she bought it or when she wrapped it and that kind of thing. And, and uh, Ivy was excited about this gift. And, and um, she could hardly keep it to herself. And um, she kept asking me, Daddy, do you know what your present is? And, and, and uh, you know, she had, I'd ask her questions and she'd give me clues and, and she began to ask me what I knew. And, and before long, <laughs> she informed me that I was getting a brown jacket. It just kind of came out. I, she said, I think she, her exact words were, Daddy, I, you're going to like your brown jacket. I don't know. She's probably only two or three. I don't know. She wasn't even two yet. You know, she, was, she was little. It was so cute. Now, I, I, was, I, was, I was, you know, I pretty much knew what I was getting anyway. I didn't know it was going to be brown, I guess, but. But uh, uh, I pretty much knew what I was getting, so no, no harm involved. But, but what I want you to understand is that in, a, in much the same way that that little girl was so excited, uh, or she held so much excitement inside about a gift for her daddy, um, it, it, she couldn't contain it. And in, in much that same way, we should be bursting with excitement of the good news of the gospel uh, to the point that we cannot contain it. We must share it. We, we have to uh, engage people with it. And, and I'm sure that's how she was. She couldn't stand it. She had to engage me with this news. And folks, uh, we ought to be that way with the gospel because it's, it's so much better a gift than anything we get on Christmas morning from under a Christmas tree. You know? Think about that for a minute. And what, I, what, I wanna, what I'm talking to you about is impassioned proclamation. Well, that's the title of the message today. Impassioned for proclamation. In Paul's letter to Philemon, he gives us an image of the gospel. And, and, and if you're not careful, uh, when you read this letter, you'll just completely skip over it. And you won't even notice. You know, this letter is about the gospel. This is the gospel on display. This is love and forgiveness and reconciliation and restoration. You know, a lot of people say, oh, this letter, it's about how to have good relationships. Or it's how to deal with runaway slaves as a Christian. And, 
You know, and, and, and it is that, I guess. You know, it, it's part of it. But primarily, this letter is a message about how to live out your faith in the gospel. Like we've told you as we've preached through this little letter, we're not saved to sit in a pew. We're saved to serve. And then we, we tried to show you that when, when you're saved and you're indwelt by the Spirit of God, you're compelled to pray. You want to pray for people. And Paul's praying for this church. He's praying for Philemon. He's praying for Onesimus. He's, he's compelled to pray. And so are we. And you want to pray and seek the Lord. And you realize you're redeemed for reconciliation. That's what we looked at last week. Is your, your relationship with God has been restored. You, you personally have been made right with God. And you have a ministry that God's called you to. To help others reconcile that same relationship with God. And to help them reconcile other relationships in their lives. And finally, once you're a child of God. You are impassioned for proclamation. It's part of who you are. The Holy Spirit in you uh, gives you that passion for sharing the good news of the gospel. You, you have to let it out. You have to let people know, I've got a gift for you. And it's from Jesus. And it's his love. Folks, that's a gift everybody needs. And we ought to want to give that to them. Paul was passionate about sharing the gospel, the good news. You know, the, uh, the Holy Spirit in a believer gave him a passion for sharing the gospel. And I want you to understand today that if you're saved, you are impassioned for proclamation. You ought to be impassioned. There ought to be that passion in you to proclaim the gospel. It's an it's, it's a, it's a impulse that comes from the Holy Spirit that compels you to live out at, uh, the gospel and to pro proclaim the good news of the gospel. Jesus loves you, that he died for you, that he rose again, and that he'll save whosoever calls out to him. That's good news. And that's worth sharing. Oh, man. When we look at this text today, I want, I want to share with you at least three actions that you take when you're impassioned to proclaim the gospel. When you love Jesus and you love the gospel and you can't contain it, these things just kind of happen. And I think it's what we see uh, with, with the Apostle Paul as he's finishing out his letter. It's just, just him living and loving like Jesus. It's just him being who God's made him to be. But there's three actions I want us to take note of when you're impassioned for proclamation. The first one is this. When you're impassioned for proclamation, you're compelled to forgive like Christ. You're compelled to forgive like Christ. As Paul, Paul ends this letter. He, he, we've talked about it a lot as we've looked at this letter, as, as we've worked our way through. He, he, it's about forgiveness. And he's appealing to Philemon to forgive Onesimus, his runaway slave, and, and to accept him back into his, a, a relationship with him. To, and so he's counting on Philemon's love for the Lord, as he talked about earlier, and Philemon's love for all the saints. And and, uh, you know, that, th that that love will move him to compassion, that he's going to love Onesimus because Onesimus is now a brother in Christ. And in verse 17, he tells him this. He says, if you count me as a partner, then receive him as you would me. And Paul says, hey, if we're partners in, in ministry, if you're my brother in Christ, when Onesimus comes to your door and he knocks, you welcome him just like you would if it was me. <laughs> your runaway slave, the one who probably stole money and possessions from you when he left, remember him? When he comes, you welcome him like you would if it was me knocking at your door and coming, coming around. You know, this, this, is the, this is the forgiveness of Christ. You know, when you can forgive somebody who's stolen from you, when you can forgive somebody who's betrayed you, uh, you know, when, when you forgive somebody who's wronged you in any way, you exhibit the love and forgiveness of Jesus. And that's what happens when you're, when you're about the gospel. When you realize the love of God and you're impassioned to proclaim the gospel, you're, you're apt to forgive people because Christ has forgiven you. And look, look, Paul takes it another step in verse 18. Look at verse 18. He says, but if he's wronged you or owes you anything, put that on my account. 
And so, he said, Paul, Paul tells Philemon, listen, if there's anything that Onesimus owes you, anything at all, I'm willing to pay for it. Paul said, he promises to pay any debt that Onesimus owes Philemon. That's, that's loving like Jesus, isn't it? That's what Jesus has done for us. And then Paul, Paul basically he says, I'm writing this with my own hand. In verse 19, he says, I'm, I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay. See that? And so basically Paul's saying, hey, he's, he's indicating he took the pen. Remember, he, he usually used an amu, a, a, amenuensis. Sorry. I just like saying that word, but it's basically a secretary. He uses somebody to write his letters for him, you know, and uh, and, and uh, most likely it was Timothy. And he says, okay, Timothy, hand me the paper and the pen. I'm going to write this down. And Paul's writing this, and he's basically gave Philemon his personal I owe you. You know, I owe you whatever Onesimus owes you. I will pay. So that's what he's saying, you know. He, he, the words charge and, and repay that, that's caught up in here, they, they're, they're business terms. They're, ca- they're, they're finance terms. And he's basically saying, I will take on Onesimus' indebtedness to you. Let me take over his bank account or his, his payment plan. Right? That's what, he, what he's saying. And so then at the, at the end of verse 19, basically he says, not to mention to you that you owe me even your own self besides. Paul's saying, hey, remember, well, first he says, I'm not going to I'm not gonna bring it up, but then he brings it up, and he says, remember, you owe me your own life, your own soul. And so, you know, this is, this is probably because uh, Paul was the one who led Philemon to the Lord, and so he, he probably, you know, he was saved because of the ministry of Paul, and, and Paul said, hey, you know, if I had to come and preach the gospel, you'd still be lost, and so, you, you, you know, you owe me. I don't know what it was about. Maybe, maybe Paul had paid some stuff for Philemon. We, we don't know for sure, but, but uh, Paul is confident in Philemon's love and his willingness to forgive. And he may be even uh, positive and confident that Philemon's going to forgive the debt <laughs> that Onesimus owes him, whatever that may be. That, and so that he might not even have to pay it. But, but Paul's confidence, in verse 20, he says, Yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. And so he's showing his confidence that Philemon's going to do the right thing. And, and um, you know, we, we need to realize those who've been reconciled to God through Christ should be willing to do the same for others who offended or wounded us. Because, you know, as we've sinned against God and God's forgiven us, we ought to be willing to forgive others. Ephesians 4.32 says, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And so we we should never forget, never forget that you know that that we will never forgive anyone as much as God has already forgiven us. You know, we ought to always be willing to forgive. Forgiveness releases the power of the gospel. Forgiveness uh, reveals the love of Christ and, and forgiveness transforms hearts and lives when you forgive people. It says, I love you. And that's what Christ has done for us. Clara Barton was the founder of the American Red Cross. And, and uh, one day, um, a friend of hers reminded her of some vicious deed that someone had done to her years before. But she acted like she hadn't even ever heard of the incident. And her, her friend said, don't you remember it? Miss Barton said, no. I distinctly remember forgetting it. That's forgiveness. Forget it. There's some things worth forgetting. And that, that's good when it comes to forgiveness. And, and so when you're impassioned for proclamation... The gospel is a priority in your life. And because Christ has forgiven you, you want to forgive others and you want to lead them to experience the forgiveness of Christ. And so forgive like Christ. You know, for some of you, there's probably people in your lives that have offended you. They've hurt you. 
Maybe they owe you. And you're for, finding it hard to forgive. But I want to tell you, when you're impassioned with the gospel, with, with, the, with the, the desire to proclaim the gospel, and Christ is in you, you can forgive them. And I want to encourage you to forgive like Christ. When you're in passion for proclamation, you want to forgive like Christ. Another action that, that you take when you're in passion for the gospel is you expect great things. You expect great things. We see this as we look at verses 21 and 22. But, you know, William Carey, he's known as the father of modern missions. And he, he was a missionary to India in the late 1700s, the early 1800s, and He's, he's known to have made this statement. You've probably heard it, and you probably didn't know who it was from, but, but William Carey is the one who's credited with this statement. He said, expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. <laughs> Folks, when you're saved and in passion for the gospel, you expect great things from God. Uh, you know, when, when God's at work and you know that God's an all-powerful God and you know that God can do great and mighty things and, and, and you're uh, passionate about Him and what He can do and what He's going to do, you expect God to do some awesome stuff. And when you expect God to do some awesome stuff, it gives you a lot of courage. It gives you a, a lot of strength. And, and, uh, and so that, that's what's going on. You expect great things from God. And I think Paul... It's showing that he has some pretty high expectations here uh, in, in these couple of verses. Paul encouraged Philemon to do the right thing, and he was confident that he was going to do the right thing. And when we look at the first words of verse 21, he says, having confidence in your obedience. So he said, hey, I, I, I'm, I'm fully confident that you're going to forgive Onesimus and that you're going to make things right and that you're going to handle things in a way that honors God. We, we need to have that confidence in, in people, in our partners in ministry. We need to expect great things from them. You know? <laughs> and um, we also see it in verse 22. Paul's optimistic that God's going to provide a way for him to be released and, and visit Philemon. When you look at verse 22, he says, hey, uh, go ahead and prepare a room for me because I trust that through your prayers... God's going to hear your prayers. You're a praying, a prayer warrior. You're a partner in the ministry. And through your prayers, I will be granted to you. God, you know, we're praying that God will release me and I'll be able to return uh, to your house and, 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 and be with you in the church. And, and so Paul's, have, you know, he's got some confidence there. We see that. And I, but back in verse 21, Paul writes, he believes that Philemon will do more than that he says, I believe that you are knowing that you will do even more than I say. And so Paul's expecting Philemon to do even more than he's asked. The message paraphrased it like this. He says, I know you well enough to know you will. He says, you'll probably go far beyond what I've written. He doesn't say exactly what he'll do. You know, uh, some, some speculate that, you know, that he hoped Philemon would, would um, free Onesimus. So, you know, going beyond what is expected is, is maybe saying, hey, you know, you're not just forgiving Onesimus and welcoming him back as a slave, but, but, you know, going beyond means you'll free him. And he'll be a free man. And um, even though uh, uh, typical for a lot of Christians that had slaves in that time, it's hard for us to think that way that Christians had slaves, but but uh, typically, a lot of those Christian slaves who were really obedient to Christ, their slaves were treated like members of the family. And, uh, you know, they, they were very close and, and, and loved and, and cared for. But he, he's, he's, maybe the expectation is that Philemon will go even further and he'll free Onesimus. And others think maybe that um, going beyond means that um, Philemon will send Onesimus back to help Paul because... As, as Paul was sharing earlier, you know, he says, hey, I'd love to keep him with me. He's a great help. And so as, as Philemon's reading the letter, he's thinking, hey, you know, uh, going beyond means let's just go ahead and send him back to Paul and give Paul what he's wanting. And, and maybe that's what Paul's hinting at. I, I don't know for sure. Nobody knows uh, for sure. But regardless, Paul believes that Philemon will forgive Onesimus, that he's going to do the right thing, and that if he doesn't uh, do what he expects, it'll be because he goes beyond 
what he expects him to do. Paul has a positive outlook and he expects God to do great things. You know, a lot of times I think that um, uh, we don't expect enough from God. We expect too little. We plan too little. And our God can do awesome things, mighty things, beyond what anything that we could ask or think. And I, obviously I, Paul knows that. But a lot of times it's our perspective and it's how we speak and it's how we share and it's how we plan that determines how great a thing God does. And so Paul's expecting more. I heard about a young psychology student who was serving in the army and he decided to test the theory. He drew kitchen duty and he was given the job of passing out apricots at the end of the chow line. Now, rumor has it, I guess, that the army apricots are really not very good. And so they didn't get eaten a lot. And so he decided to do this experiment. And the first few soldiers that came by, he, he asked him, he says, you don't want any apricots, do you? Well, 90% of them said, no, I don't want any apricots. <laughs> well, after that, he tried the positive approach. And he said, you do want some apricots, don't you? And so uh, using the positive approach, over 50% of the soldiers that came by, even though the apricots technically were terrible, they, they wanted apricots. <laughs> and then he tried a, another technique. It's called the either-or selling technique. And this time... When the soldiers came by, he says, one dish of apricots or two? Well, what happened was, 40 per, uh, uh, let's see, 50% of those soldiers that were asked one dish of apricots or two decided to take one dish of apricots. And 40% more decided to take two dishes of apricots. So 90% of them wound up with apricots. And so a lot of times it's perspective. And I, I, we need to change our perspective, folks, and we need to realize that our God can do great things. And we need to expect great things from God. And we need to attempt great things for God. And I believe Paul believed that. And I believe that's hinted here in the text. And, and so, you know, in the same way that those who were discouraged from taking apricots declined them when... when you know, then when we don't expect great things from God, we'll likely never see great things from God. We need to expect great things from God. We serve a great and mighty God who can do all things, and we ought to expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. That's the attitude of a redeemed saint of God who's in passion for proclamation. Sadly, many Christians never attempt anything for God. Don't expect anything from God. You know, faith in God's work and the expectation of great things, it, it, it's a great encouragement to, to people and, and it's a great motivator to keep the faith and attempt courageous tasks for, for God's glory, you know. And, and we ought to, that's the reason we're to encourage one another and lift one another up and pray for one another. And we ought to challenge one another and hold one another accountable because our God can do great things. When you're impassioned for proclamation, for, 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 for proclaiming the gospel, you expect great things from God. You forgive like Christ. Another expectation of a heart and passion for proclamation is this. When you're impassioned for proclamation, you acknowledge your partners. Acknowledge your partners in ministry. And You know, typical for Paul as he wraps up his, his letter, he acknowledges those People, a lot of times those that are with him or those that he's writing to, he's acknowledging all these partners in his ministry, the people that are writing with him, the people that are laboring with him, the people that are praying for him or praying with him, and the people he's praying for. And so Paul closes out his letter and he's acknowledging that God's work is accomplished as we work together as brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, God saves us as individuals. I can't get saved for you and you can't get saved for me and nobody can get saved for anybody else. That's between you and God. But when it comes to doing the work of the gospel, the ministry that God's called us to, to do, we got to do that together. 
He doesn't call us to work alone. They're, they're no lone ranger Christians. They're no uh, uh, solo salvationists. You know? We work together. We're partners in ministry. Uh, you know, when you become a child of God, you become a part of a family, a forever family, a family of faith, an eternal family. You become a part of God's church. And in that church, you have a role and you have a mission and you have a task. And, and, and working together is what takes place. And we do that because we're impassioned for proclamation. We want to preach the gospel. We want to share that truth. Paul mentions five men as he wraps up this letter that are his fellow laborers. He calls them there at the end of verse 24. My fellow laborers. And he acknowledges uh, Epaphras. And uh, Edmund Hebert points out the list is identical. If you go back and you read Colossians, it's the same list that he uh, lists the, the people in Colossians, which is called the sister letter, probably transported with the letter to Philemon, except for one person's omitted. Jesus, justice is omitted here. And um, so all these people would have been known to Philemon. Philemon would have known these people. Paul knew them, and he's saying, hey... Basically, he's probably saying, these guys will vouch for me. They've, they've seen Onesimus. They, they've, maybe they've heard of, uh, Onesimus. They know what's going on, and they agree with me. Uh, but um, Epaphras was from Colossae, and he was, he was well known by Philemon. Uh, but now, Paul calls him a fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. Now, maybe he's in prison with Paul, I guess, in Rome, but... Paul doesn't see him as a, a prisoner of the Roman Empire, just like he didn't see himself as a prisoner of the Roman Empire. He sees him as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. He's a captive of Christ. And so are you, if you belong to him. That's what gives you that passion for the gospel. Then he talks about Mark, and Mark is John Mark, the author of the second gospel. And uh, at one time, just like Onesimus, he had been useless to Paul, and Paul wanted to send him back. But now... He's faithful and useful both to Paul and the Lord. Aristarchus was a close associate of Paul. He's probably from Macedonia. You read about in Acts 19 and 20. And he traveled with Paul to Rome in Acts 27. And Colossians 4.10 calls him Paul, Paul's fellow prisoner as well. And, and uh, tradition says he was martyred in Rome under Nero. Demas is mentioned here as well, and, uh, and uh, he's mentioned in Colossians 4.14. But in 2 Timothy, Paul informs us that Demas deserted Paul. And uh, he says it was because he loved the present world. And so I, I point that out to make this. If this is the same Demas, uh, Paul's acknowledging partner, so he even recognized those who don't even quite live up to expectations. Because even when they don't always live up, quite live up to expectations, God can still use them. And he's still using them. Maybe recovered, just like John Mark. But then he also mentions Luke. And uh, this is uh, who he calls the dearly loved uh, physician in Colossians 4. He's the writer of the Gospel of Luke and, and Acts. And he traveled with Paul and he helped care for Paul and he became a dear friend of Paul, and a faithful friend. And so all these men stand with Paul. They're, they're his partners in ministry. And, and Paul knew they were faithful and trustworthy. And so did Philemon. And so if they're speaking out for Onesimus, uh, they're probably going to be heard. And, and, um, you know, and, and so Paul ends his letter then in verse 25, much the same way he began it. He starts it with Jesus and he ends it with Jesus. And, and he starts it with a prayer more or less and he ends it with a prayer and he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. He uses that full majestic title, the Lord Jesus Christ again. And, and it's a prayer for his partners in ministry. And, and it's a reminder we're in this together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. He's, He's praying for Philemon. He's lifting, lifting everyone up. We're, we're in this together. We're partners in ministry. You know, it, it's interesting how a lot of times uh, partners get left out, but, but when you're laboring for the Lord, you acknowledge your partners. You're thankful for them. You encourage them. And 
um, you know, Edmund Hillary was the first man to climb to the summit of Everest in 1953. I know that's before most of our time, but, but mo most fail to acknowledge he, he had a partner in his success. He didn't do that all by himself, but he's the one that gets credit for it. You know, um, he had a partner in his success. Hardly anyone ever hears his name, but his name is Tenzing Norgay. And on the way back down the mountain, Hillary actually fell and was almost lost. Nobody would have ever known that he had made it to the peak. But Norgay was able to pull him back up and save his life. And Edmund Hillary then lived to tell a great story because of this virtually unknown Tenzing Norgay. <laughs> and someone asked Norgay why he didn't make more of it and why he didn't brag about it. And he said, we mountain climbers help each other. It's a shame, really, that Norgay isn't recognized along with Hillary for ascending to the peak of, of Everest first. He deserves the same fame, really, doesn't he? And you know, when I think about that, I think, you know, the Apostle Paul is probably the most famous missionary ever. The most famous Christian ever. I mean, he, he's, he's a model. He's maybe the greatest Christian ever. The greatest missionary ever. But, but Paul wasn't a solo evangelist. I mean, as great as he was. When he was on his missionary journeys, he had Barnabas and Silas and, and Mark and, and Timothy and Luke and and, I, and all these partners in ministry. And I want you to understand, he, he had these partners in ministry, and so do you and I. We're, we're in this together, and, and uh, we need to work together to accomplish the mission that God's given us. And that's to proclaim the good news of the gospel. Preach the gospel. We're in passion for proclamation together. <laughs> You know, we're impassioned. We need to do it together. And when you're a child of God, you're filled with the Spirit of God and you're impassioned for proclamation. That leads you to forgive like Christ and to expect great things from God and, and to acknowledge and encourage your partners in ministry. We have a story to tell. You know, the good news of the gospel changes lives. And, and the gospel is seen in this little letter to Philemon. W.A. Crystal is a famous pastor of First Baptist Dallas. He pastored there for over 50 years. and He was a powerful preacher. And, and um, he saw what Paul pledged to do for Onesimus and how it mirrors what Jesus has done for us. And I hope you noticed that. And, and I, that, that's the main thing. It's the gospel. It's a, it's a picture of the gospel. And and in a sermon he entitled, For Love's Sake, he preached on February 1st, 1959. He brought a message to, to a close with these words. I want to share them with you. I'm going to read his words so nobody gets confused. This is not mine. He says, Onesimus must repay what he owes. But how? He doesn't have anything to pay with. He's a slave. He's nothing. And restitution has to be made, but, but how? Onesimus holds in his hand the letter, accept him as you would me. And if he's wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand, I will repay it. <laughs> Does that remind you of anything? Does that remind you of you? Does it? Does that remind you of our Lord and our Savior standing before God? We owe to God how many instances where we have fallen short. Our debt to God and the Lord seeks payment. And we have nothing wherewith all to pay. How would you remunerate God? How would you repay God what you owe the Lord? How would you do it? Falling short. Falling short in a thousand ways, in a thousand days. How would you repay? How would you pay? <laughs> Lord, I have nothing with which to pay. 
My righteousness is as filthy rags, Isaiah 64, 6. And all the goodness of my life is a stained garment. I have nothing wherewith all to pay my debt to God, what I owe the Lord. And our Lord says, if he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. I will pay it. When we stand before the Lord and the Lord would meet out to us the penalty of our sin, what is that? The wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23 And the soul that sins, it shall die. Ezekiel 18.20 And we stand before the Lord and the Lord looks in your face and He asks you, Are you guilty? Have you ever sinned? Guilty. Did you do this wrong? Do you owe this debt? Guilty. And we stand in the presence of Him who searches the soul and knows the heart. Lord, you know I am guilty. Like the cry of Job. I have sinned. What shall I do unto thee, O thou preserver of men? Guilty. And the penalty Death. The wages of sin is death. And our great Savior says, If he had wronged thee, or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. I will pay it. And that death of our Lord was a substitutionary death. It was for you. It was for us. He, he died in our stead. He took our place. He paid our debt. He paid the debt. He washed us in his own blood. And he died in our stead. And we have life. And freedom. And glory. And forgiveness. All because he paid it all. If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee all. Put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written with mine own hand. I will repay it. And that's the gospel message we preach. Friend, that's the gospel. Paul expressed the gospel in his proclamation and in his life. Paul not only preached the gospel, he lived the gospel. He said, if Onesimus owes you anything, you you put that on my account. I will pay. Folks, that's the gospel. That's what Christ has done for us. And you and I are called to do that same thing. In passion for the proclamation of the gospel. Not only with your words, but with your lives. And my plea to you today, Christian, is will you proclaim the gospel with your life, with your voices, and with your life? Will you preach the gospel through your life's love and forgiveness? God help us to do that. That's what happens when a heart is in passion for proclamation. The gospel lives through them. Maybe there are those today, maybe you're watching online, maybe, maybe you need the Lord, and uh, maybe you stand of those in one of those in need of salvation and forgiveness. You owe a debt that you cannot pay. But Jesus paid it all on Calvary. He paid the debt that you could never pay a, a thousand days, a thousand ways. You never, never pay it. And I urge you today to just come to Christ right now. Give your heart and life to Him and experience the great passion of His love and His forgiveness personally. Will you do that right now? Let's bow our heads. Let's respond in faith today to whatever it is that God has spoken to us. Let's pray and then we'll, we'll sing and we'll respond. Father, we give you this time. Be glorified in it, Lord. Change hearts and lives. Lord, help us to be impassioned for proclamation of the gospel. Lord, to live lives that proclaim the truth of your great love and forgiveness. 
We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember Redemption's hill Where your blood was spilled For my ransom